Well, if you have your Bible, open up to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. That's where we're going to be, verses 12 to 50. So it's good to be shocked sometimes. We can all too often become complacent. Uh, If you ever need to be shocked back in the reality a little bit, just read the words of Jesus. Now, we know he's the life giver, and we know life is good, and we should enjoy all of God's gifts that he gives us. And so we shouldn't expect Jesus to say, hate your life. But he did. He said those exact words. Now, what do we do with that? What was he trying to communicate? The things we chase our t- or spend our time chasing, these are usually the things Jesus tells us to stop wasting our time on. When he says, hate your life, what he's saying is, don't live for the things of earth. Live for the things of heaven. Invest everything you have in the things of God. Don't waste your time investing in the things of earth. Because when you invest in the things of earth, what you're doing is you're investing in darkness. So this means living for him completely. It means, it doesn't mean not enjoying the gifts now. You can enjoy the gifts now, obviously. It it just means that you're going to use those gifts in a way that they're supposed to be used and enjoyed according to how God has created these things. So, basically the message I have for you this morning is simple. It's the same as Jesus, what he said. Lose your life and gain it for eternal life. That's it. So verses 12 to 15 read, The next day the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, so they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Now, there was a buzz in Jerusalem. You could like feel the electricity in the air. Kind of like you know the day of the Super Bowl or when the Canadian men's Olympic hockey team was going for gold against the USA or something like that. Except in this case, you just magnify that by infinity. So the large crowd in Jerusalem was there for the feast and they heard Jesus was coming and they all went and they got these palm branches, and, and, which is a symbol of royalty. And they ran out to meet him and as he arrived, they were waving the palm branches and crying out in jubilation, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And so in order to fulfill the scripture, Jesus found a young donkey and he rode it into the city. Now the city was partying like it was New Year. Finally, the king of Israel had arrived. Our long-awaited Messiah is here. We will soon be free from Roman oppression. Or so they thought. The fact of the matter is they had no idea why Jesus had come. They had this military slash political conquest in mind by calling Jesus king of Israel. Uh, What they were doing was committing treason against Rome, the so-called king of kings, Caesar. Now, I'm not saying Jesus isn't the king. He very much is the king, and, and it is a political title that he holds. But he had come to overcome Rome, not how people thought, not with swords and spears, because Rome wasn't the problem. The problem was sin. The problem was the evil that resides in the heart of man. The problem was the Rome of the heart. The, the Caesars we have enthroned in our hearts needed to be dethroned before any political conquest could be accomplished. He came to lose his life so that you might gain eternal life. Now this is a common theme when talking about Jesus. It seems everyone just wants to slap a, a label on him, whatever they want, you know. And for some, Jesus is like the head of the Republican Party. Uh, for others, he's the ultimate social justice warrior, walking with hot soup and judging no one for anything ever. Jesus is the only historical figure I can think of where we tolerate this sort of thing. It's like Jesus is just fair game. He's whatever you want him to be. If, if you want a little side of Jesus, that's cool. If you want a little more of Jesus, okay, good for you. He, maybe he's just a good moral teacher. Like the Simpsons depicts, Vishnu and Jesus and Buddha, they're all in heaven because they're all equal. But the one thing we never stop to consider doing is letting Jesus define Jesus. He's the only historical person who is up for this insane revisionist self-interpretation. The only historical figure I can think of where we tolerate this. Then you hear people talking about my Jesus would never do that. Yeah, you know why he wouldn't? Because he doesn't exist. We craft a Jesus in our own image, and it's no wonder he never offends us 
because he's us with a beard and a white robe. And this is what's happening here. The people were projecting their own expectations of who the Messiah ought to be. And as usually it was wrong, and as usual, it was false. Yes, he will come back with military might and conquest, with legions of angels and heavenly warriors to do his bidding, but that's not why he came the first time. First, he came to die for our sins and rise from the dead and defeat death forever. Before the kingdom of heaven would reign on earth in literal physical form, he would first make it reign in the hearts of his people. Jesus is king and we are kingdom citizens, but we live out that citizenship now as refugees in a foreign land. He's coming again to conquer and take the earth for himself once and for all. He has all authority in heaven and earth now. But he's coming and when he comes, he's going to take final control of it and dethrone all other kings. So the people had it half right. See, they had it half right. He is the king. He is the Messiah. He is the conqueror. But he's not going to do it like you expected. Even the disciples didn't get it, not until he was risen from the dead at least. Then they understood the significance of what it meant riding into the town on a donkey and how he fulfilled the scriptures. All the excitement about Jesus coming to town continued to spread throughout the, the, the city as the crowds who were there had seen him raise Lazarus from the dead. And so they're coming to see him again and they're testifying about him. And this is why they all went out, because they've seen all these miracles, and they're like, oh, here comes Jesus. He's on a colt. He's riding in. Yay, he rose Lazarus. Yeah, yeah, our king is here. This is wonderful. And so the Pharisees saw what had happened, and they realized they weren't gaining any ground. Everyone was going after Jesus. But while the people rejoiced and cried out praises about Jesus, he was preparing to set the record straight. The time of celebration and jubilation would soon turn black and joy would soon turn to confusion and sorrow. Jesus had not come with a physical sword to plunge through the Roman Empire, but with a spiritual sword to destroy the work of the devil. And after that victorious, triumphant entry, that entry where people presumed that Jesus had come to preserve their earthly lives, Jesus came with this message, lose your life for me, and you will gain it for eternity. So, so some Greeks were at the feast, and they, and they wanted to see Jesus. And so when Jesus was informed that the Greeks were coming and wanted to see him, he, he tells this parable in verses 23 to 26. He says, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. Where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now, after that celebration at the gates there, you think Jesus would come out with a victory speech, right? All right, guys, we're here. Yeah, yeah, let's do this. But instead, he starts talking about death. A grain of wheat must fall into the ground and die before it can bear much fruit. So, therefore, whoever wishes to live has to be like the grain of wheat. You have to die. Boy, Jesus really had a knack at killing momentum, didn't he? But it's not, it wasn't about momentum. It was never about momentum. It was never about popularity. It was always about accomplishing his father's plan. His death would bring many to eternal life. His resurrection would be the first fruits, and we are that harvest. So Jesus says, if you wish to live, hate your life for my sake, and you will gain eternal life. Now, the only way to gain eternal life, according to Jesus here, is to hate your life. Like, what does that mean? What's Jesus saying here? Like, imagine that motivational Facebook post. Hate your life, like a mountain in the background. Is he suggesting we live a life of depression, going about with groans and sighs all day? No, no, no. What he's saying is don't live for the world, the worldliness, the earthly stuff. Live for eternity. In other words, hey crowd, forget about military conquest. Don't worry about Caesar. Live for God and God only. It's, it's, It's essentially the same message where he says give to God what is God and give to Caesars what is Caesars. Rome is not the issue. Following Jesus is the issue. Follow him and where he is, you shall also be. The preservation of your life is found in hating it and losing it for Jesus. It's a paradox. 
don't, you know, don't work anymore to just retire. Sure, retire. You've got to retire at some point, but don't work for that. Work for the kingdom to, to conform to Christ. Put to death every fleshly impulse in you and bring it to conformity to Christ. Every skill, every gift you have, use it for him. Can you sing? Sing for him. Can you labor with your hands? Labor for him. Any increase you make, devote it to him. Like the song we sang, the cause of Christ. The cause of Christ. If you're a Christian, you own nothing. He commands you to use it all for his purposes. And if this sounds uh, like a burden or, or, or oppressive to you, then I'm afraid you still haven't, haven't grasped really who Jesus is or what he's done. You need to lose your life for him and gain it with him. So his soul became troubled and he understood what awaited him at the cross, the fullness of the wrath of God against all our sin. But Jesus didn't run away from it because he knew why he came to this earth. And he took this opportunity to demonstrate to the people listening to him what it means to hate your life. He said in John 12, 28, Father, glorify your name. Then a voice from heaven said, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. God is raising up a new generation of bold gospel witnesses and with the advent of social media, we get to see it and communicate with the saints, communicate with the saints all over the world like we couldn't before. A few months ago, a brother from the USA was outside an abortion clinic pleading with women and he saw a guy drive by in a truck with a Jesus sticker. He said, hey man, nice sticker, Jesus loves you. Now this guy got out of his truck and he began to beat the guy up, which is shocking. Like I thought you were, you know, you had the Jesus sticker, he started beating me up and Anyways, he punched the guy in the head, he was bleeding, and he was thanking the Lord Jesus, and he's calling out to the women, you know, stop, don't go in there, and, you know, like, love your babies, I love your babies more than you do. Now that's what it looks like to hate this life and to gain it for eternal life. Jesus' concern was not for his own well-being, it was for the glory of God. Now, do you desire the glory of God more than your own physical comfort? A voice from heaven was heard when Jesus prayed, Father, glorify your name. And this is what the voice said, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. You see, even if you're attacked, even if you're maligned, even if you're used, God will use it for his glory. You cannot fail if you live for God's glory. He will glorify his name and that is certain. Jesus' path was the path to the cross, the path of hating this life. And Jesus told the people this voice was for their sake. That he must be lifted up, which was the metaphor for being crucified. But the people were confused. How was the Messiah going to die? I thought he's the eternal king. He's going to sit on David's throne. Again, the Bible illustrates plainly they didn't know who Jesus was or what his purpose was. They created a Messiah in their own image, and when Jesus told them the truth about his purpose, they couldn't comprehend it. He ignores their question, and he just says, the light is here now. Walk in the light and be sons of light. We have two options. Be children of light or children of darkness. That's it. The cosmic war between good and evil finds its crossroads at Jesus Christ. Will you follow him, become sons and daughters of light, or will you continue following the devil of old and walk in darkness? Ironically, walking in the dark means to cherish this life and make a name for yourself, while walking in the light means hating this life and seeking the glory of another, Jesus Christ the Lord. So after Jesus had said these controversial statements, what does he do? He leaves. <laughs> Chew on that. I'll be back. Which is really another common theme in his ministry. He would drop these heavy truth bombs and leave the scene, let the dust settle. It's amazing to me that one second the whole city is filled with excitement about Jesus, then the next he's gone and no one believes anymore. <laughs> Just like that. Even this was prophesied as Isaiah, he wrote in uh, Isaiah 53, which John 12, 38 quotes, so that the word of the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? John tells us they could not believe because Isaiah says again in verse 40 here, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. 
Isaiah 53 is a famous messianic passage that perfectly and in detail predicts the ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Many have dubbed it the suffering servant passage, but I like to call it the suffering savior. Isaiah prophesied how Jesus would be rejected by many of his own people, and it was because they could not believe. They could not believe on account of God's judging them, blinding them. Now notice the wording here. They could not believe. They couldn't just choose to believe. They couldn't. It's, it says they could not. We see this throughout the whole Old Testament. People rebel against God. He offers grace, and they just keep rejecting him, so God judges them by blinding them. He gives them over to their own rejection of him, their own sin. He gives them over, and it overtakes them. And essentially, he says, you don't want me? Fine. Be, be blind, be deaf, be dumb. Have it your way. Look at Pharaoh as an example. When Moses came asking to let the people of Israel go, some passages say Pharaoh hardened his heart, while others say God hardened his heart. And in both cases, Pharaoh and the large crowd in Jerusalem, the main similarity is that they love the glory of man more than the glory of God. There were some authorities who didn't believe in Jesus, but they wouldn't, or, or who did rather believe in Jesus, sorry, but they wouldn't confess it because they were afraid they might be kicked out of the synagogue. Verse 43 says this, for they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. They loved their own lives, and it hindered them from eternal life. Don't be like the foolish people we read about in John 12. Don't love this life. It's temporary. I mean, what kind of madness is it to exchange infinite treasure for temporary trash that's going to rust and corrode and be destroyed? Lose this life. Hate this life. It's not worth it. Now, I know that word seems harsh, hate. You know, your mother probably told you, never say hate. Well, Jesus said it, so your mother was wrong. Sorry. <laughs> but when you put everything in this earthly life in comparison, in parallel to, to Jesus, that's the only appropriate word to use. Put your earthly treasures next to the Lord Jesus and it becomes trash. You have to hate that because it's so garbage compared to Jesus. Lose this life and gain eternal life with Jesus. Verses 44 to 50 say this, And Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. That's good news, by the way. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, <clears throat> but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what you say and what you speak, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. His word will judge us. His words he has spoken. He came to give eternal life. And we're so unstable. One second we're waving palm branches because Jesus gave us a new car. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And then the next second, we're shaking our fists at the heavens because something didn't go our way. The next second, Jesus opens his mouth and he says some stuff we don't like. And we go, oh, I like the part about where you said you love me. But then the part where you said, you know, go and sin no more, I didn't, oh, I didn't really like that part, Lord. How could you love me? If we're unstable. He came to be lifted up to die for our sins, to resurrect. Therefore, he says, hate this life and gain it for eternal life. If he died for, like, your sins, how could you not die to those same sins? He died for your sins. You died to those sins. Does that make sense? You can't live for the stuff he died for because then you're just spitting in his face. These are his words. He hasn't come to give us a comfy life here. He came to die so that we could bear much fruit. He expects us to follow in those footsteps, to die to the world, to the sin, to the things that he literally died for. Now, we may be uncomfortable with that. We may be uncomfortable with that. But our passage ends with Jesus saying, what I say, I say as the Father told me. He is literally speaking the words of God, of the Father. 
It's not like he's concocting this stuff. What can I tell these people? Uh, no. What the Father tells him, he's just repeating. And that's how we ought to be. The Father tells Jesus, the G- Jesus tells us, we tell others. There's no originality in Christianity. No such thing. It's not Christianity. When people say, when, when you know, I know some pastors and stuff, and a lot of them, they don't preach from the Bible. <clears throat> and, I, and I ask them, guys, what, like, what do you say <laughs> when you preach if you don't use the Bible? What do you say? You know, just a bunch of self-help stuff. Like, honestly, if I didn't have a Bible and you're like, preach a sermon, I wouldn't know what to say. You should see my notes. It's like word for word. You know why? Because I don't know what to say. I'm just, I'm glad Jesus gave us a word so I can just say what he said. It makes it easier for me, and that way I don't make errors, because if I just say what he says, I'm always right. (laughs) You know, like, let's not complicate this thing. He's speaking the words of God. There's no dispute with this. Our duty is not to dispute it, but to embrace it, to love it, to obey it. It doesn't mean you you have to be comfortable with it. You know, like I, I heard a... A sermon clip and the guy was preaching and he said every time I open the Bible it offends me but then I get on my face and I get right with God and then it doesn't offend me anymore you know th- th- there it is you don't always have to get the warm and fuzzies but it's your duty to obey not to dispute embrace love it get right with God it won't offend you anymore he is good he is glorious he is worthy of more than just our palm branches don't have a palm branch Christianity where you're just waving the branches whenever your life is going well and then you throw them to the ground when things get hard. He's worthy of everything. Lose this life for him and gain eternal life with him. Is that a good trade deal? Donald Trump says, you know, talks about trade deals. That's a good trade deal. That's the best trade deal. Losing garbage for eternal life. Come on. Uh, when I preach this at Street Help, not this exact sermon, but when I preach a similar thing, I mean, it's the gospel every week, you know, get, you know turn from your sin and, and get Christ. Who wants that? And everyone was like, well, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. We just hope the Spirit worked on their heart. That's not in my notes, so I'm going to stop. <laughs> Let's pray. So as I pray, can I have somebody? Um, yes, the communion. Yeah. So, Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, Jesus, for... You can just start as I'm praying. We thank you, Jesus, for your, uh, for your exchange that you, you, you've offered, uh, losing our life to gain eternal life with you. It's one that we embrace. It's not one that is easy. It's not one that... Um, it's not easy. That's the only way I can put it. But you strengthen us. Your burden is light, and uh, your yoke is easy, but it's because you take it upon yourself. So help us, Lord, to rest in you, to walk in you, and to reject the things of the world in exchange for Christ. We love you, and we honor you in it all. In your name, Lord Jesus, amen.